We are starting a brand new series today in the book of Ephesians. We'll make our way verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. Um, I have to say um, um, the, the timeliness of preaching through this book has been a reminder of God's work in our own heart and our life here at City Church. I think that um, could, what a relevant time for us to be going through uh, the book of um, Ephesians. Um, if you do not own a Bible, I want to encourage you to get one. We will gift you one. We have Bibles out in the foyer. You're welcome to go out there and to get one. If you're going to be um, at City Church for any length of time, you're going to need a Bible. Uh, we preach from the Bible um, here at City Church. I do what uh, most people call exegetical preaching, which is what we, we try to just unpack. What does the text say? Um, I believe it is the preaching of the Word that will transform our hearts and lives. And so I kind of like the Scriptures to kind of guide where we're going. Um, we always have people that kind of say, would you preach on this or do this or say this or why don't you preach on this? That's usually kind of whatever your uh, preference is. Uh, but we like to open up the Bible, and as the Bible kind of guides us into different areas, uh, we believe that God will use that uh, to be able to speak into our everyday life. So here we go, book of Ephesians. We'll probably be in Ephesians up until uh, spring of next year. Um, a few things that I want you to know about Ephesians. Uh, first and foremost, it is a theological, uh, I would say a masterpiece. It is filled with almost everything that you need to know that is essential to the Christian life in just six short chapters. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul breaks his letter up like he often does into kind of two divisions. Uh, the first half of the book, the first three chapters, Paul tells us about who God is and what has God done for us in Christ. And so we'll be spending a lot of time talking about that over the next several weeks. Uh, the second half of the book, chapters 4 through 6, provides some of the most practical insights found anywhere in, on, in Scripture on everyday matters like marriage and forgiveness and conflict management and raising kids and workplace relationships and just so much more. And we'll get to all those things in the second half of our series. But what is important in Ephesians is bringing together those two sections, both the doctrine and the duty, the belief and the behavior. And that's what gives us a thorough picture of what it means to live out our faith in everyday life, not based on our own abilities, but based on who we are in Christ. Now, Ephesians was written primarily as a survival guide a survival guide for local gatherings of believers that were living in a very hostile environment. At this time in church history, most of the churches, most of the gatherings were basically house churches. Um, people would gather into homes, into smaller spaces, and many times it would be throughout an entire region. And so Paul writes, and we heard from Acts 19, kind of the beginning of the church of Ephesus, Paul writes to this, this group of believers that are scattered throughout this region and probably a lot of different house churches, and he writes into a very hostile environment. Let me tell you a little bit about Ephesus itself. Um, Ephesus was one of the most impressive cities of the ancient world. It had a population of around 250,000 people. That is a huge city for uh, the ancient world. So uh, Ephesus was actually the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a major political, economic, social, and religious hub. Politically, um, Ephesus was one of the regional capitals of the entire Asia Minor area. Um, economically, Ephesus was a seaport city that was located near the intersection of kind of modern Europe and Asia, and its strategic location made it one of the primary trade centers in the Roman Empire. There was a steady stream of visitors that flowed through the city of Ephesus for both commerce reasons and for uh, religious reasons. Matter of fact, if you've got kind of an old school Bible uh, that's got maps and things in it, you can usually go into that maps area and you can see exactly where Ephesus would be located. A lot of times even those maps will have like Paul's second missionary journey or Paul's third missionary journey. And you can look on those maps or you can Google it when you get home and see exactly kind of where um, Ephesus was Located Now, socially, um, Ephesus was a cosmopolitan area. It was very multicultural. It was home to one of the largest libraries in the ancient world, and many of the most recognized scholars um, of the world at that time lived there. Um, Ephesus was also home to a very large theater that had a seating capacity of about 24,000 people. So again, you have to think, in the ancient world, 
That is a massive building. Um, religiously, uh, Ephesus was just a hodgepodge of cult and religious. As a matter of fact, it, uh, of, of religions, it, it boasted about 50 different temples for various gods, including the largest temple in the ancient world. We actually have a picture of it, kind of a modern uh, rendition of it. This would be the uh, temple of the goddess Artemis. We'll actually dig into that story a little more in our series, but this temple was dedicated to the goddess Artemis, who is believed to have great power over heaven, (coughs) earth, and what they would consider the underworld. This temple uh, was considered one of the ancient world's seven wonders of the world. And so, again, very prominent. Let me quote from a New Testament scholar here, Clint Arnold, about the influence of Artemis Uh, the goddess Artemis, the influence of this goddess and the cult attached to her permeated every area of life for those who lived in the city. The temple was a major banking center for the city. Um, Her image adorned the coinage of the city. A month of the year was named after her. Olympic-style games were held in her honor, and she was trusted as the guardian and protector of the city. So you can see what a significant role uh, the goddess Artemis and the temple dedicated to her played in the city itself. Um, Sexual immorality was literally an industry in the city. Uh, Many of the temples included uh, prostitution as a part of their worship rituals. And so the strategic influence and the strategic location (coughs) of Ephesus is why Paul after a brief visit to the city during his second missionary journey, during his third missionary journey, he spent almost three years um, in this city. Um, Ephesus eventually became a religious hub, a Christian hub for that region. Several in- influential churches were birthed out of the city into other uh, city, local cities. The uh, New Testament book of Colossians, another letter that Paul wrote, uh, would have been heavily influenced by the church in Ephesus. <clears throat> Many scholars believe after the death of Paul that John the, Bab- or John the Apostle, uh, the one that both wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, uh, many believe that John uh, actually served as a pastor in the city of Ephesus. So as you can gather from kind of this introductory information about Ephesus and the church there, it was difficult to follow Jesus in Ephesus, which makes this letter very relevant for us. Um, Ephesians helps us understand what it looks like to not only survive, but to thrive as Jesus followers followers in an ever-increasing non-Christian context. What does it look like to live as a follower of Jesus in a context that does not follow Jesus and may even be hostile toward Jesus? Jesus. So let's set the stage for our walk through this magnificent letter by looking in great, greater detail just at those uh, first two verses this morning, and then we'll dive into some uh, much deeper stuff starting next week. So recap, verses 1 and 2, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, every one of these phrases is important, uh, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul follows kind of a normal pattern of writing a letter in his time, the Hellenistic era, um, it, which would often include the name of the sender, uh, the recipients of the letter, and then a brief greeting. And that's what we have here um, in the prologue. So let's talk about each of these things. First, the sender of this letter is Paul, who says he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Again, most New Testament scholars believe that Paul wrote this letter from his Roman imprisonment. There were four letters that came out of his Roman imprisonment. Um, Ephesians was one of those letters. It would have been written around 60 or 62 A.D., so about 10 or 15 years after Paul had been to the city of Ephesus and a church was birthed in the city of Ephesus. Paul gives himself a title here. Paul says he is an apostle of Christ Jesus. (coughs) Now, if you know Paul's backstory, if you're a person that knew Paul pre-Jesus, Uh, You might respond to Paul saying he is an apostle of Jesus by saying, do what? What are you talking about? An apostle of Jesus. Like if you knew Paul back in the day, (coughs) you would have known he was a militant opponent 
of Jesus and his followers. He was a persecutor of the early movement, the Jesus movement, and he wanted to eradicate the followers of Jesus. As a matter of fact, he was identified initially by his Hebrew name, which was Saul. And you can see in the name Saul, it kind of carried that uh, regal hint of Israel's very first king, Saul. Uh, so it would have been a, a name that, uh, that symbolized, um, again, kind of a, <coughs> a, a regal idea of kingship. But he had this supernatural encounter with Jesus on one of his escapades to arrest Jesus' followers in the town of Damascus. His life was forever transformed in that moment by the good news of the gospel. He was literally, we can say, knocked off his horse, right, and knocked off his life trajectory, his life path in that moment. So he eventually adopts his <coughs> Roman name. He is a missionary to the Gentiles, so it makes sense. Um, his Roman name, Paul, uh, means small, small Paul. And so the word small speaks to this persecutor turned preacher who spent the remainder of his life humbly serving Jesus, making Jesus famous, which he did in the city of Ephesians, in the city of Ephesus. Ash is the, can you turn the air down a little bit? I'm roasting, which means I'm going to be coughing very soon. Um, so he did that in, or maybe I just need a fan or something. I got a fan on him. Just clip it right here. So we have um, Susan Beach probably has a fan or something. <clears throat> the apostle knocked off his horse. And so eventually again, he becomes Paul. Uh, he takes on this humble approach of introducing Jesus, making Jesus famous. You guys are impressed that Ashley just sat right there and on her app, Everybody's waiting for her to get up and go to the thermostat, right? She's just using the app to turn down the air. This word apostle, uh, now some of you are going to be like, now I'm freezing, Devin, thank you. The idea of apostle is someone that is sent by Christ with the authority of Christ to represent Christ and to proclaim the good news of Christ. So we think about Paul being an apostle, we, we think that he was indwelled by Christ, he was sent by Christ, and he was empowered by Christ. And everywhere this guy went, he preached Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you dive into the story of what happened in the city of Ephesus, Paul creates a riot in Ephesus because he's preaching the gospel and people are turning from the worship of Artemis, the goddess Artemis, they're turning to Jesus, and this made the local idol merchants furious. They made money selling little artifacts, setting up at the yard sales, setting up at the trade shows with their little Artemis booth, right? Artemis idols. They made their living selling merchandise. I don't know if they did T-shirts or whatever, Artemis shirts or Artemis hats or Artemis idols, but these merchants that were making their living uh, through selling merchandise for the goddess Artemis, they start losing money. If you go back and read what happened in Acts chapter 19, an insurrection ensues, and 20,000 people gather in that theater I was talking about earlier, and they began chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, Paul being Paul, he sees these 20,000 plus people in the theater, and they're all chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and Paul's like, let's go. Get me a mic. Set me up. I'm getting ready to preach. 20,000 people. And his ministry team is like, slow down, Paul. I don't think you need to go up in there. Uh, you're not going to come out on the other end alive if you do. And so they pull Paul back, and Paul eventually leaves the city. We'll come back to the story later in the series. But this is what's going on. He causes a riot, sees this crowd. I want to go in and preach to them. What transforms a persecutor into a preacher who is ready to charge 20,000 people with the good news of the gospel. What transforms Paul, this guy who was ready to eradicate the church, into the one who was ready to give his life for the church, what transformed him was a Jesus encounter, which Paul is very quick to point out. 
was not initiated by him, but initiated by God. Paul says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It was not a religious wake-up call. It was not a theological debate that won Paul over. It was not a 12-step recovery program that pointed Paul in the right direction. Paul is clear that it is by God's initiative that he is an apostle. It was not self-generated. It was God-generated, God-initiated. And what Paul was, a persecutor of the church, no longer defines him. When I was studying through this, it reminded me of our Philippians series that we did a couple of years ago. And Paul's incredible words in Philippians chapter 3 when he's describing his own transformation. Paul says in Philippians 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself, Paul says, have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then he gives his kind of his, his religious pedigree here, his resume. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had, Paul said, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as, and our English translations are kind here. They translate this, the ESV translates this as rubbish. Like if you get worked up over what Zach said, then you don't want to know what Paul had to say in the original language here. I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. What does Paul say? All that stuff that I was about, it is nothing, it is nothing that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead." Paul says, everything that I was before, my spiritual resume, my religious resume, everything that I was, every box that I checked, every qualification that I met, all of that is nothing because everything that I was means nothing. It no longer defines me. It, what I am now defined by who I am in Christ, by the will of God, which Paul says, by the way, is also true of you, is true of the recipients. So we have the sender, and then we have the recipients to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I am writing this, this apostle who has been, who, who has been transformed by the will of God, I am writing to a group of saints. And the Ephesian believers probably respond, do what? Do you know me? Saint is not the word that I would use to describe myself. I mean, the idea of saint is holy and consecrated to God and set apart by God for his service. Now, Paul is very clear in the letter to the Ephesians that it's not because of your saintly behavior that you are a saint. It is because of the work of Jesus in your lives that you are saints. We are saints not based on who we are. We are saints based on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done on our behalf and is doing in our lives. We are saints based on who Christ is and not who we are. So, get ready for it. We're going to say, I am a saint. Some of you are like, I, I can't do it, Devin. If you're a follower of Jesus, based on who you are in Christ, your title from Paul is that you are a 
saint. Okay, ready? If you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to say it with confidence in who Christ is. Not because of your own self-righteousness, but because of who Christ is. You're going to say, I am a saint. Ready? I am a saint. Most of you didn't believe it. I can tell by the way you said it. This time we're going to say it where the online audience can hear you. Ready? One, two, three. I am a saint. Paul says to the faithful saints, to the saints who are in Christ Jesus. You see, our righteous standing is not based on our behavior. It is based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, we are considered holy because he is holy. And we approach God based on the, the righteous standing before God that we have in Christ. And that's what makes us saints. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote here for a very small part of City Church. Most of you are going to have no clue who I'm quoting right now, but I'm about to quote Andy Minio, who's a Christian hip-hop artist, and he has a song called The Saints. And in Minio's song, The Saints, Minio says, now I don't know what you've been told about us. Now, I'm not going to rap it. I'm just going to say it. You have to do the rapping in your own head. I don't know what you've been told about us, but we're going to love them even though they doubt us. We just visiting like we some out-of-towners got them asking, how does God turn y'all into shouters? Like, hold up. We don't really think we better call us perfect. No, never. But we glad to be called saints because Paul called us that in his letters. We set apart for the Savior. He led our hearts to the maker. Can I get an amen for Andy Minio? It's good stuff right there. We are saints living out our faith on this earth. Notice where these saints are. These saints are in Ephesus. Think about it. Saints in Ephesus. What? Saints in Ephesus. This is like saying Auburn fans in Tuscaloosa, right? Like you don't belong there. I told you what Ephesus was about and that's not about following Jesus, but these saints are in Ephesus. They are in hostile territory. In Ephesus, there is a local gathering of Jesus followers living out their faith in a hostile environment. This phrase speaks to how the gospel of Jesus penetrates our everyday lives. That means that there are saints living out their faith in Ephesus, raising their kids, working their jobs, shopping in the markets, getting married, going to school, living everyday life where God has placed them. But here's the key. Their lives are no longer defined by their allegiance to a false god named Artemis. Their lives are no longer defined by the values of the earthly city in which they live. Their lives are now defined by their faithfulness in Christ Jesus. And notice I said faithful in Christ Jesus, not faithful for Christ Jesus. Jesus, because it is not what we are doing for Christ that defines us, but who we are in Christ that defines us. The word faithful here means that we have a belief in something, and our belief in Christ enables us to live out our faith. Let me use just a very basic illustration to illustrate this. If you own a phone that you have to charge up, you charge it most of the time at night, right? It's charging while you're sleeping. And you either plug that phone in to some type of charger or you lay it on some type of device that charges um, through that. But that phone in and of itself is not charging itself, is it? Like if I lay my phone beside my bed on my bedside table at night and I don't lay it on my charger, I don't plug it into anything, and I get up the next morning and I look at my phone and it's like, why is my battery depleted? Well, your battery's depleted because you didn't charge it. You didn't hook it up to the source that will charge your phone. It is that charger that gives the phone power. It is the presence of the charger, the connection of the charger that indwells the phone and enables the phone and gives the phone 
power. That is the difference in being in Christ and simply living for Christ. Because as I am in Christ, it is being connected to Christ and abiding in Christ that he indwells me and enables me and empowers me to live out my faith. Faithful in Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus, by the will of God, to all those saints who are in Christ, living out their faith in the grind of everyday life in Ephesus. Paul's got a greeting for them, and he has a greeting for us. And this greeting is defined by two foundational Christian concepts. First, grace. Paul says grace to you. Grace is that unmerited, undeserved favor and kindness of God in providing salvation for us through the work of Christ. And not just salvation, but enabling us to live out our faith in everyday life. Grace upon, grace upon, grace. So from go, from the green light, Paul invites his readers to accept, appreciate, and live out God's grace. The way we say it here at City Church is our core values is that grace is a way of life. And we have received grace and understand grace that you naturally begin to live out grace in your everyday life because you recognize the depth of your own depravity and the magnitude of a God who redeem us by His grace. The result... Of embracing God's grace, Paul says, is peace. This word peace stems from the Hebrew word shalom, and it's not just the idea of peace, it's the idea of wholeness and completeness. And Paul says that through grace there is peace that has been made. Peace between God and humans. Peace with God. Peace with each other. You see, grace is the cause and peace is the effect. It's the impact that when you live in grace and understand grace and accept grace and embrace grace and live out grace, it creates peace in our lives. We live, and we've just seen this splashed on the headlines, not just globally, but in our own community. The division that has taken place in the one side versus the other and the tension that all this creates and How do we ever as Jesus followers speak peace into that? But as people who are living in our Ephesus, saints who are living in our Ephesus, Jesus followers who are living in our Ephesus, living in the everyday life that we live here, going to school, shopping, right? Our culture, our city, the tension in our city right now, the division in our city. We are called to be saints of peace, people of peace who have received the grace of God and who speak peace peace between, between God and humans and human on human peace, that we should be people who unite and bring peace to our community, not people of division, not people choosing sides, but people who are seeking to unite and bring peace in the name of Christ, grace and peace. And, and what is the source of both this grace and the peace? Paul says it is God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace are from God through Christ. And that means it's not driven by circumstances. It's not driven by how I feel today. It's not driven by my emotions. But grace and peace are driven by the good news of the gospel. And so right out of the gate, in his introduction, Paul speaks to us and he says, Know who you are in Christ. And know what that means for our everyday living. That we are people defined not by what we were and not by what we have done. But we are people who are defined by who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us and is doing in us. And right here in his introduction, he says to us, City Church, we are saints. We are set apart by God for his purposes. We are believers in Christ, empowered by Christ. We are recipients of his grace and peace, and we are called to live out our faith in the Ephesus in which he has placed us. Man, think back to the passage that 
Zach read at the beginning in Acts 19 when this whole thing got started. Um, Acts 19, it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus, right? So here he arrives in the city to which he's now writing a letter. And there he found some disciples. Now remember, this is very early in the journey. It's very early, early. And so there's people that are hearing bits and pieces of the gospel, but they haven't heard the entire story. And so Paul finds these disciples, these people who want to follow Jesus, but they don't even have the full story. So he says to them, do you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And they said, who's the Holy Spirit? Like we've not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And so again, um, when John the baptizer came along, his message spread, uh, just like the message of Jesus began to spread. And so they had heard, again, bits and pieces of the gospel through what John taught, but not the fullness of the gospel. And so Paul said, Jesus, or John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come. That is Jesus. So Paul lays the full gospel on them. Like, you got to go all in, right? Uh, what John was pointing to was Jesus. And so again, they said, on hearing this, they're baptized in the name of Jesus. They said, yes, we want to be followers. And so Jesus, or Paul, lays his hands on them. The Holy Spirit comes on them. They began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There were about how many? Twelve. Twelve men in all. Twelve people when Paul rolls up into Ephesus. Twelve people who had a glimpse of the gospel, but not the full gospel. Twelve people that Paul says, let me give you the full story. Let me point you to Jesus. And they follow Jesus, and the Holy Spirit fills them. He enters into their lives. And so that, that's where this whole thing in Ephesus starts. Twelve people. And Paul enters the synagogue. This is kind of his normal pattern. He enters the synagogue for three months. He spoke, speaks boldly, reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, this was the, the movement that we know as Christianity now. It wasn't called Christianity earlier. It was called the way. So when they began speaking of the way, uh, evil of the way, before the congregation, Paul's like, well, I'm out. If you're not going to listen, if you're going to be stubborn, I got, there's a big audience out here that will listen to me. And so Paul pulls out of the synagogue, which he often did, and he, he shows up at this hall of Tyrannus, which was a public gathering where Paul could sp speak to Jews and Gentiles alike. And so Paul shows up. He begins to speak daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years. Watch me. Twelve people, what does it say at the end? So that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Both Jews and Greeks hear the gospel in a two-year window. Twelve people, to the language of Acts, every person in that region heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. How did this happen? It wasn't just because of this one dude that shows up with a passion, a persecutor turned preacher. No, it's because Paul is giving out the word. He's preaching the word. And men, women, boys and girls are coming to faith in Christ in Ephesus. And as they come to faith in Christ, they've got good news to share. And so they begin to share it with family and friends and neighbors and people by the way. And so for two years, the gospel builds and grows and continues and moves forward. And little churches are planted all throughout this region, little house churches of people, men, women, boys and girls who say, I want to follow Jesus. And that's why we're standing here today, because that's how the message goes forth, that Paul proclaims to us, you are saints in Ephesus. Devin, you are a follower of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Decatur, in Priceful, in Hartzell, in Athens, in Trinity, and you are faithful in Christ. Grace to you and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So know who you are, City Church. You are saints who are in Christ. Now go tell someone. That's how the gospel moves forward. We go and tell people in our community where God has placed us, who we are in Christ, what he has done for us, and who they can be in Christ through the finished work of Jesus. Now, I want to tell you, next week, buckle up, because Paul is about to drill down 
drill down on what it means to know who you are in Christ. And it's going to make you squirm. It makes me squirm a little bit reading it and processing it, trying to figure it out. I've been trying to figure it out for 2,000 years, and we don't have the full answer, right? But buckle up, because Paul's going to say some things not to make you uncomfortable. Listen, not to make you uncomfortable, but so that you will know who you are in Christ and what he has done on your behalf. City Church, you are saints. You are saints by the will of God, by the will of God, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads for prayer.